What name could contain such a glory? In the cool breezes of Eden, brought from the infant earth, one arose, the voice of his creator speaking his identity to life. Adam, man. And as heaven waited short with breath, the creator spoke yet another, Eve, mother of all the living. So it was with Abraham, named in the promise as the father of nations, Peter, the rock upon which the church would stand. The name called to life the destiny within. The name set the stage for all that was to come. And unto us a child was born. And what name could contain his glory? For he was mighty God, as the universe gasped into being, flinging rays of light from his presence to pierce the void, to shatter the shadows to a tapestry of color. And he is mighty God, shattering our darkness, revealing our light, our truth in him. He was everlasting father when orphaned Israel needed a father's touch. When we, with grief-stricken cheeks, need the embrace of one who never leaves. When we have lost our way to dark horizons, it is our everlasting father who lights the way home. He is Prince of Peace. When, like Elijah, we need the still small voice in the turmoil's midst. When, like David, we need the melodies of his presence to soothe our troubled minds. He is sanctuary within our trials, shepherd guiding us to still waters. And yes, he is wonderful counselor. God who gives counsel in the chaos, crafting disorder into calm and failure into beauty. He is a voice for the voiceless. He is dignity for the stateless soul. It is he who raised up a lowly shepherd to become a king. He who took the fishermen of Galilee and made them leaders of history. It is the counselor who redeems our lost years, breaking chains that have kept dreams imprisoned and joy confined. The name reaches across eternity by the splendors of galaxies, sung by the passions of angels, roared in heaven's fervor, exalted in creation's unfettered rejoicing. What name could contain him? What title? What soul renown? For this is our wonderful counselor. This is our mighty God. This is our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace. What name could contain Emmanuel, God with us, Yahweh, the great I am. What name could contain the word of life, the light of the world, the king of kings, the Lord of all. We bow to the name that holds every other in its matchless worth. What name? such a glory. What name but Jesus? We cry Jesus. We cry holy is the name. Merry Christmas, everybody. Man, it is, uh, I'm so thankful to be able to be here, to worship with you, to, to gather together, to celebrate Christmas, and maybe you showed up today and you're thinking, um, we're going to get the typical Christmas message, right? Like, slow down, be intentional, you know, ignore the hustle and bustle, and remember the reason for the season, and while those are really, really good things, and I think as followers of Jesus, we should remember those things, and we should take those things seriously. That's not exactly what we're going to talk about today. I think it's so easy for us to prioritize maybe intentional time with family, which is really good, being slow, being intentional with one another. I think abiding in God, resting in God is crucial. It's so important, but I think if we're not careful, we can 
miss what specifically the season of Christmas is all about. And the season of Christmas, the, the story of Christmas, is telling of the birth of Jesus. It's sharing the good news that Jesus is born, the Savior of the world. This is the reason we celebrate. This is why Christmas. It's a time to be filled with joy, to celebrate all that he is, to celebrate all that he has done, to celebrate what he was sent in the world to do. Jesus is the joy to the world. And just like the song we sang earlier, no matter our circumstances, no matter what we face, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? He's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's Jesus. And there's power in his name. We've been in the uh, Advent season. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Advent, we talked about it just a minute ago. Kali shared with us. Advent really just means arrival. This is the season, the time of year when we as followers of Jesus are anticipating the arrival of the coming king, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Not unlike all those years ago, centuries before Jesus' birth, there would have been people who were desperate, longing for this coming Messiah. They were oppressed people. They were... They were Tortured and beaten and all these different things were taking place and they were desperate for this Messiah. They spoke about this. They were an oppressed people and they were longing for the one who would come and break chains. He would set captives free. He would overthrow the Roman government. He would, he would right all wrongs. They were longing for the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And they were calling for it. They longed for the Messiah. They weren't just anticipating him, they needed him. And if you look at the story of Christ's birth and everyone involved, you don't get what you might expect, especially for someone that was so highly anticipated, someone that was so special. The Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world is to be born. If I told you today, hey, the Savior of the world is coming, he's, to be, he's going to be born, what kind of image would pop in your mind maybe what kind of scene would you begin to paint in your mind of this someone as important as the savior of the world well I'll tell you what I would see I'd be like a party like maybe the maybe the president would be there for sure and like some famous celebrities would be there and I haven't really given it much thought but maybe somebody like Ed Sheeran would be singing a song that he wrote for the occasion and then somewhere in the back, this cool-looking dude, Eric Clapton, would be doing his killer guitar solo. And when you thought it couldn't get any better, Snoop Dogg would come on out. And he would do his rap part. Right? It would be this party. There'd probably be some, like, world-famous, world-renowned chef cooking a ton of amazing food. And, of course, you'd have all the media outlets there. And you can't forget all the social media influencers. Hey, just streaming Jesus here. Just check in in a minute. Right? Like, that's what we would be doing. It's a party. This is, the, this is the story in my mind, the picture in my mind. The Savior of the world is coming. Let's get out the cannons. Let's shout from the rooftops. Tell everybody about this. It would be a party, but that's not what we get in the birth of Jesus. No, we, um, we had a young virgin mother. We had a scared and unsure father. We had three wise men who lost their way and encountered a really angry king. We had a group of poor and lowly shepherds. A stable meant for animals. And an innocent, seemingly helpless baby boy lying in a manger. And uh, you, for those of you who don't know what a manger is, I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard this. Essentially, it's... A farm trough it's a trough for farm animals to eat from and a lot of them are made out of wood some of them were made out of stone they were very rigid they were hard to break they had to stand up take a, take a beating if you will and as Mary was looking around this stable and she saw this manger that would have been the safest option available to her for her newborn son 
Talk about a humble beginning. This is how Jesus came into the world. No fanfare, no VIP treatment. Just a dirty stable. Now I think um, when we look at everything going on in the Christmas story, I think a key theme that's overlooked or maybe just not recognized about the story of Christmas is, I think a key theme is fear. You may ask the question, what does fear have to do with Christmas? And if fear does have something to do with Christmas, I don't really want to talk about it during Christmas time, which I get. But I wonder how Mary must have felt being told that she had been chosen to give birth to the Son of God. You've been chosen. Don't you think she might have been just a little overwhelmed at that thought? In Luke 1, we read, uh, verse 30, Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. I think right there we see, of course she was scared. There was some fear surrounding the birth of Jesus. She was a virgin, unmarried, and she was to give birth to God's only son. I think she might have been a little fearful of that. It's not only Mary's side of it, it's also Joseph's side of it. He, he feared his role. Can you imagine? Dad's in the room. Can you imagine being responsible for being the earthly father to Jesus, the Messiah? My three-year-old scares me. Can I get an amen? All right? He wears me out. I can't imagine what he must have been going through thinking about how am I going to raise God's son? And it's not just raising Jesus that he was worried about. Joseph was worried about what the society of the time was going to do or how they were going to treat Mary as an unmarried mother. Then you have the wise men who they were afraid of what King Herod would do to them since they didn't come back and tell him where Jesus was. And then look what Luke says about the shepherds in verse 9. Luke 2, verse 9, Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. What does fear have to do with Christmas? I'd say everything. I'd say there's a lot of fear surrounding the people as Jesus was born. But I would also say this. It's no mistake that Jesus came into the world at night. When it was darkest. Why? Because Jesus is the light. He is the light that pierces the darkness. And it's in times of chaos or or struggle or darkness that we discover all that the name Jesus offers us. The name of Jesus offers hope. The name of Jesus offers faith. The name of Jesus offers joy. The name of Jesus offers peace. As we we continue singing and celebrating, I want you to, if you can, I, I want you to hold an image in your mind. Okay, I want you to imagine a group of people. A group of people humbled by by fears and, and darkness that we often experience in our world today. I want you to, to imagine a, a cold and uncomfortable setting with people who didn't know what the future might hold. They didn't know what was around the corner. And as we sing these next songs, I want you to imagine what it must have been like for those who were the very first to meet Jesus. Would you stand with us? Let's continue singing today.
as we, uh, as we celebrate Jesus coming into the world, we also call upon Emmanuel, God with us. And we ask him, Jesus, would you be near to us? Would you love us? Would you guide us? So I want to ask, have you met Jesus? Do you, do you know the power of the name Jesus? There is power in his name. We read just a little bit ago the first part of Luke 2, and we saw the shepherds were terrified, but let's continue. Let's just read the story together. Starting back in verse 9, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that, I, that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior... Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in a manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. It says the armies of heaven came down to sing praises. And that the shepherds went from that day to spread the good news to everyone they encountered. They glorified and praised him for the rest of their lives. And I, I love this part right here. It even says, this is, this is a beautiful moment, M mother and son. It even says, Mary thought back on these events often for the remainder of her life and held them close to her heart. Now in Matthew 2, it says that the wise men, when they got there to see Jesus, they immediately began worshiping him. And they had completely disregarded the agreement that they had with King Herod. Well, why, you might ask? Because they couldn't deny what they had witnessed. See, if you follow Jesus, if you know Jesus, if you've experienced the power of the name Jesus, you can't unencounter Jesus. You can't unencounter him. You simply cannot deny what you have experienced, what you have seen, what you know to be true. By show of hands in the room, have you experienced the power of the name Jesus? Just lift your hand. Have you experienced the power of his name? Our world is so full of fear and darkness, and it's, it's so easy to get caught up in the negativity of it all. And just like every single person who surrounded Jesus at his birth, there's a lot of anxiety about what's to come, not knowing what's going to happen, what's around the corner and I, I think if we're honest, we so often tend to look at God through the lens of our circumstance, through the lens of our hardships, our fears. We look at God through the lens of the things that are happening in our life. But the reality of it is, once you encounter Jesus, everything changes Everything changes. We shift our focus. Our eyes are corrected. And now we no longer see God through our circumstances, but we see our circumstances through the lens of Jesus. Everything changes. There's power in the name Jesus. The fears and the worries and the pressures and the, the bad situations and the loss and abandonment and, and regret and the shame and the hopelessness that once dictated our lives, that decided how we felt about something, all of a sudden it begins to lose its grip. Our fear becomes love. Our, our worries become peace. Our bad situations become opportunities to feel the nearness of God. Our loss 
And I, I, I want to pause here for a minute because there's many of you here right now, like me, who are battling through a significant loss. I want you to know that it's in our loss when we can experience God the comforter. He's drawing near to you. He wants to comfort you. Our loss becomes an opportunity to experience God the comforter. When you encounter Jesus, everything changes. Our regret becomes forgiveness. Our shame becomes our triumph. And our hopelessness becomes joy-filled praise. Once you encounter Jesus, it all shifts. He lights up the darkness. He, his name means salvation. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He's everlasting father. He's prince of peace. He's wonderful counselor. This is the reality of who he is. He's the light in the dark that all who know him reflect. This is the reason we sing. This is why we worship. If you know him, then you have experienced the power of the name Jesus. In some way, in some instance, in some circumstance, he, he has brought hope. He's brought faith. He's brought joy. He's brought peace into your life. This is why we celebrate. I think fear is a theme in the story of Jesus' birth, but I also think there's another theme that gets overlooked. And I want to do something that Colonial hasn't done in a very long time, at least in the time that I have been here. So I want to create a little chaos in the room. Uh, this is what I want to do. I want to ask, can we have all of our kids and all of our students come down and just sit right here on the floor in front of me? I want to just have a conversation with them. Come on down. You're welcome, parents. Our students, our students were excited. Our high school students, they were excited. They were all they were at the front. Yeah, y'all come on in. This is this is awesome. I've been here for 13 years at Colonial on staff, and it's the first time we've done this since I've been on staff. I know we did this a long time ago, but. I don't know. I grew up in a Methodist church, and I think this is nostalgic for me right now. I want to ask, a, I, want to, I want to continue our conversation about the story of Jesus. And, and kids, I want, to ask you, I want to ask you a question. Why are we celebrating Christmas? What do we celebrate for Christmas? You, over there. Jesus, that's right. The birth of Jesus, right? This is what we're celebrating. Okay, let me ask you this question. There was an angel who appeared to a group of people. And does anybody know who the angel appeared to? I'll give you a hint. Ah. Sheep. He didn't appear to the sheep. Actually, he probably did. But who watches the sheep? Shepherds. The shepherds. That's right. We got it. I knew it was going to be sheep when I gave the bath. That's right. The angel appeared to the shepherds. Now, something that's really kind of uh, cool to know is that shepherds, they had a really hard job, right? They... They worked really hard to protect the sheep, to keep them gathered up. But what you may not know is that back in the day, shepherds really weren't seen as important people. Like, people just didn't think a whole lot about shepherds. And so people in the day might not have expected that God would send an angel to tell the shepherds about the announcement that the Savior of the world was going to be born. But that's exactly what happened. He sent an angel to tell the shepherds. So I want to read again in the Bible, in Luke chapter 2. This is the story of, that, of how that happened. In verse 8, it says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. What would you do if you were out in a field somewhere, and all of a sudden, boom, an angel appeared? That'd be a little scary, wouldn't it? I'd be scared. This is what happened. But the angel, he reassured them. The angel said, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. 
The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. What else happened? Let's read in, in, in verse 13. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others' armies, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And then suddenly the angels were gone. Okay, so they, let me recap. What happened? The angel shows up. The, the angel tells the shepherds, Hey, Jesus is about to be born. The Savior of the world is about to be born. Then a bunch of people, a bunch of armies of heaven came down. They're all praising God for it. And then the angels are gone. What do you think that the shepherds did after the angels left? Yes. That's exactly right. They went to Mary and Joseph. Was that what you were going to say? I believe it. That's exactly what happened. As soon as the angels left, the shepherds went to go find the baby, right? That the angel was talking about. So they went and found baby Jesus, and when they got there, they saw Jesus, and they believed that he was the Messiah, that he was the Savior of the world. They believed this. Everything that, they, that the angel had told them was true, and they were so excited by what they saw. They were so excited by what they saw that they told everybody that they came encounter with, everybody that they saw. The shepherds told them about it. Have you ever had something so exciting happen to you that you just couldn't wait to tell somebody? Have you ever had that happen? This is what happened to the shepherds. They got so excited, and they just told everybody that they saw. Now, the shepherds in the story, again, like I told you, they probably weren't thought of as, like, very important people. Like, probably not a lot of people were going to pay attention to the shepherds saying this, but they are important. That's exactly right. Out of all the people in the world... That God could have picked. He chose them. God chose them to receive the most important news in history. And I want to tell you something. Students, kids, God has chosen you. God has chosen you, each one of you, to share the good news of Jesus. If you have Jesus in your heart, then you have the light of Christ in you. Now, parents and adults in the room, whether you have kids whether some of these rugrats are yours, I want you to hear me when I say this. Sometimes we tend to overlook the seemingly unimportant. And I think all too often the world overlooks our next generation. I think that our world even teaches our next generation that they don't have a voice. At least not yet. Now, I don't know about you. I grew up in a church that was telling me that the next generation is the future of our church. But I want to tell you right here and right now, they are not simply the church of the future. They are the church of now. There is no junior Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moving in you, the Holy Spirit guiding you and prompting you is the same Holy Spirit moving and guiding and prompting them. And so my, my caution to all of us here, I think, I think more often than not, God is choosing our next generations to be our messenger. The world wants to tell us that they're lacking something, they're missing something, but they're not. He's doing some incredible things in our next generation. And my caution to all of us, myself included, I'm a dad, and it's so easy to just not really pay attention to what my kids have to say, and I can miss something. So my caution for us is be careful not to dismiss God's messenger. Be careful not to dismiss God's messenger. Kids, students, you are important. You have a part to play. What God can do through each one of you is incredible. And I believe that included in the story of Christmas is a reminder of the power of our next generation. You aren't simply the church of the future. You are the church now. So church, if you agree, in agreement with me, would you just stretch your hand forward and let's pray over our next generation. Father, thank you for these kids. Thank you for these students. Thank you for the way that you are moving in them. God, we pray that you would reveal your heart to them, that you would reveal the things that you would have them do. And I pray, God, that as we as adults in the room, we as parents, we as grandparents, aunts, uncles, people who are just living in society and developing a culture, I pray we would live with our heads up and we would recognize your messenger 
in our next generation. God, I pray that you would empower your voice in our students and in our kids. God, they are not just simply the church of the future. They are the church now. And so I pray, God, would you help us to partner with what you're doing in them, that we could see more and more people come to know your son Jesus because of the work you're doing in their life. We ask this in your name, and everyone in this place said, amen. Amen. Hey, if you were asked to be a part of our candle lighting stuff, we all just stay up here. If you weren't asked, we've got some candy canes for you. Parents, you can bill us for the uh, YP uh, cost. Uh, You can bill Brooke James at colonialchurch.com. And uh, kids, would you grab, we've got some candy canes here. Just grab a candy cane and find your way back to your seats. If you were going to help us with the candles, y'all stay up here just for a minute. I told you we were going to create a little chaos. Yeah, I love chaos. So we're going to move into um, we're going to move into one of my favorite times during our Christmas gathering which is the lighting of the candles. And I I, I want to give you something to think about when it comes to the candle lighting. This this is something that, I'll tell you, it's a little nostalgic for me. I grew up doing this. This represents some different things in my mind and in my heart as we do this. But I believe in tradition, but I don't believe in tradition for the sake of tradition. I believe that if we can, we can hold to some of our traditions, but tie it back to the truth of the church throughout years and years, back and linked back to those who were worshiping Jesus long before we came along, then I think we have something really powerful. And so today as we move into our candlelight portion of our gathering time, I want to give just a couple of thoughts as we think about candles, because the symbolism of a candle can be pretty profound if we let it be. What are a few things that we notice about a candle? Right off the bat, the first thing is, would be obvious, right? We notice the light. What does the light represent? The light represents Christ, light in the world, pushing back darkness. The second thing we might notice, especially with candles we might light in our home, is, is it, there's an aroma associated with the candle. And this represents the Holy Spirit, that He's with us, He's guiding us, leading us, prompting us. The aroma represents the Holy Spirit. And then the third thing you might notice is the heat from a candle. This represents the power of God. The power in the name of Jesus. So would you stand with us? some other candles, please. Would you all go and just light the rest of the room? So as you light your candles and you hold your candle, I want you to remember. Remember the light of Christ that you carry within you. And remember that the reason for the season is to celebrate the birth of Jesus, but it's also this call on our life to share the light of Christ with those around you. 
Remember that the Holy Spirit is guiding you and is with you. And remember the power of the name of Jesus. Merry Christmas. You can blow out your candle. I hope you enjoyed um, celebrating with your church family. I hope that God has spoken to you in some rich and unique ways as we've gathered here. I hope that you're reminded that it's not just the intentional time we spend with our loved ones, but it really is a call in our life to reach out to those around us, to love our neighbor, to share the light of Christ. And I want to just mention a few things before we disperse today. Um, if you received our discussion questions, maybe you've had, you have our app and you've been receiving our discussion questions. There's been some Advent questions at the end of those that have marked each week as we've headed towards this day. And each week has represented a theme. The first week is hope. The second week is faith. The third week is joy. And this, our final week, is peace. And as you leave here today, I just want to pray a blessing of those themes over each one of you and your families. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. You sent him into the world full, full of humility. And, and through his life, he showed us grace and truth so that we could know you better. When Jesus entered the world, we had a visual representation of, of your love for us. And through his ministry, he showed us the meaning and the importance of faith family. And even though we know that we are not the light itself, we ask you, Father, would you help us reflect the light to those around us, that we may be able to shine Christ's light brightly together. We know that you've called us through Jesus to a life of loving those around us. Father, we ask, would you help us to have faith in that mission and in that call? so that we can serve you. And even though we know we will have dark days where it will be easy to fall back into fear and doubt, would you help us continue following you in faith, trusting that you'll meet us there. Help us to remember that in any circumstance you are there, and we don't have to view you through our circumstance, but we view our circumstance through what you have told us. Give us peace. Thank you for all that this holiday means. May we keep it close to our heart and treasure the greatest gift of all, the gift of Jesus, Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, wonderful counselor. So in the name of Jesus, we celebrate and we pray. And everyone in this place said, amen. Hey, God bless you. Just a reminder, we're not going to be gathering together next week. We're taking a church-wide Sabbath because we believe that rest precipitates work and so we want to make sure that we're resting we're abiding in the father we're resting in him god bless you all we'll see you january 7th merry christmas